Which one of the following is an example of market risk? A. The inability to trade a security due to market being closed. B. A delay in the opening of bank accounts for a firm. C. The price of a security fall into lower than price paid. D. A counterparty not honoring its obligations to its clients. Right? So the price of a security falling to lower than the price paid is an example of market risk. Moving on. When using the self-certification method of identifying operational risk, the issues relating to consistency are likely to be greater than, to be greater for, larger companies, larger firms, newer firms, firms which transact business purely online, firms which have weak capital reserves. So, uh, problems with consistency are most likely going to be found in larger companies because um, the bigger the company gets, the more difficult it is to implement the same policies and procedures across every department. A very small company um, can have consistency because it's, it's a small one. You can monitor everything probably from one office. You see everyone in front of you. You implement the policies. You see the results. Uh, quickly and the same across everything, across every department. But if for very large companies where every department is run differently, um, identifying risks consistently across our department is difficult. Which two criteria are most likely to be used for scoring each individual risk? Were the internal drivers of business risk for a life insurance firm's underwriting department are being risk assessed using a risk using a ranking method? Now, of course, the question can be simply uh, answered just from the first sentence. Uh, uh, which of the following two criteria are most likely to be used for scoring risks? So for scoring risk, we usually look at uh, the, the likelihood and the impact. And we use that risk score uh, in, the, in, the, in the ranking and rating method. Oh, sorry. I said C. Forgive me. Sorry. The answer is B. Half of you had a heart attack. <laughs> sorry. So it's the impact and the likelihood. A member of a company's IT department has been careless in his programming work as he knows that it will not be checked by a supervisor. This type of problem is normally described as a moral hazard, a physical hazard, an institutional risk or a strategic risk. So uh, the answer is moral hazard. Moral hazard means not caring about the consequences. For example, banks will take a lot of risk. They will they will they will defraud the customers. They would cheat. They would lie. 
and they would take very bad decisions because they don't care if anything happens to them uh, the central bank will come in and bail them that's moral hazard uh, the programmer doesn't care because he knows nobody's gonna check after him this this careless having no care about your actions is what the moral hazard is the ratio of the bid offer spread to an asset's mid price can be used to compare different assets what does it mean if asset a has a higher ratio than asset b a a is more liquid than b or b is more liquid than a or a is more volatile than b or b is more volatile than a So, if A has a higher bid offer spread than B, it means that A um, has a higher uh, liquidity risk. It also means that A has lower liquidity. If A has lower liquidity, then B has more liquidity. So the answer is B. Consistent confidence levels and time levels are fundamental to which of the following challenges to establishing an enterprise risk management program? Aggregation, cultural, measurement, time scale. This can be answered. I know it's a bit confusing, but uh, consistent confidence levels. Confidence levels are usually calculated using normal distribution uh, or Monte Carlo. So using mathematics. Whenever you use, ma use mathematics um, to find out something, you are, you are measuring. Aggregation means bringing all of the things together, aggregating, summing, grouping together, totaling. It's not cultural. The answer is measurement. When an asset has a negative beta, the asset can be expected to have no price correlation with the market, offer a risk-free return, increase in value as the market falls, always fall below benchmark values. All of you are saying D, why? Always fall below benchmark? No. If you have a negative beta, that means you move opposite direction to, to the market. It's like negative correlation. So increase in value if the market falls. Which one of the following is an important tool in the process of risk identification? 
risk categorization, risk measurement, risk ranking, value at risk models. Right, so when identifying risk, a very, very important tool is to categorize risk when we identify them. So the answer is A. Which of the following is a recognized driver of international business risk in the financial services market? A, technological, B, geopolitical, C, compliance, D, managerial. The, the most recognized risk or driver or of business risk when you are dealing in an international business uh, context is understanding all of the rules and the regulation of every country and following them. Lack of understanding of these rules, lack of compliance is what causes much of the risk for international banks. C, compliance. International cooperation on banking regulations has been addressed by central banks coming together under the auspices of the IMF, the World Bank, the G20, or Basel Committee. It should be easy for you. Right, the Basel Committee. A liquidity gap analysis which shows a net positive figure for a particular month indicates that A. Anticipated cash inflows exceed anticipated cash outflows. B. Anticipated cash outflows exceed anticipated cash inflows. C. Projected income exceeds projected expenditure. D. Projected expenditure exceeds projected income. So when you're looking at liquidity gap analysis, you're looking at inflows and outflows. So if you have a net positive figure, that means you have a surplus. Your inflows are higher than your outflows. So it's A. The key approach taken when using extreme event testing is to A. Measure the earnings at risk B. Eliminate existing risk factors C. Highlight particular risk market risks D. Spread risks across a portfolio Right, so uh, extreme event testing usually highlights particular uh, market risks. Uh, 
What is the significance to an investor where the probability distribution curve of an investment has a fat tail? A. The investment is classed as low risk. B. Performance is highly sensitive to interest rate movements. C. There are likely to be large deviations from normal anticipated returns. D. General market movements will be closely matched. Right? Where there is a fat tail. So you can have a usual normal distribution which looks like this. Um, a fat tail is a tail that actually has either big skewness or big cortosis. Without going into much details, uh, it can look, for example, like the data can look like this. Um, so it will still be centered, but it will be fat-tailed, or uh, it will be skewed towards a certain area. And that's what a fat tail is. Uh, and that's very likely that there will be large deviations from normal anticipated returns. An improved risk awareness within an organization can most effectively be achieved by linking A. Risk culture and competitive activities B risk rankings and product range, C, cash flow and risk categorization, D, employee pay and risk indicators. So, improved risk awareness within an organization can be most effectively achieved. How can you achieve a high level of risk awareness? How can you achieve a high level of um, risk ownership, a high level of uh, responsibility of of preventing risk how can you get employees to be better risk aware and better risk managers themselves how can you get them to um, care just like the programmer a few pages ago who didn't care about the pro problems in his programmer that that programmer is not aware because he knows that nobody's going to supervise his code how can you get employees to be more risk aware? By linking their pay to risk indicators. Using the ranking basis, risk A has a PESTEL risk score of 14 and risk B has a PESTEL risk score of 16. This means that risk A is considered less severe in terms of the combined issues of probability and impact. Risk A has triggered more losses in the historical period reviewed. Risk A is more likely to change in nature over the coming 12 months. Risk A has been more effectively mitigated through the use of an oversight control.
Okay. So if it has a, what is a risk score? A risk score is, again, likelihood times impact. So if risk A has a risk score of 14, that means it is considered less severe in terms of probability and impact. Which one of the following is a technique for mitigating market risk at portfolio level? A. Asset secretization. B. Credit limits. C. Risk premiums. D. Stop loss limits. So, which of the following is a technique for mitigating market risk? Securitization, this is for credit risk. Credit limits, this is for credit risk. Risk premiums are not a technique for mitigating any risk. They are a technique for measuring credit risk. Well, they can be also a technique for measuring market risk. Yeah, yeah, but they are a technique for measuring risk. Higher premiums means higher risk, measuring it. So the answer is D, stop loss limit. We use it to mitigate market risk. Which of the following statistical methods is used when conducting operational risk scenario modeling? A. Credit migration probabilities, B, normal distribution, C, log normal distribution, D, confidence level. I don't think this was questioned. I think this was removed, but if you want the answer, it's a log normal. It's a way of charting. If you know log charts, um, but I don't think this is important for the qualification anymore. So let's just move on. Where the interest rate under an investment arrangement is 8%, but the annual equivalent rate is, light, is slightly higher than 8%, this means that the interest rate is variable rather than fixed, the interest rate is payable at least twice a year, the investment period is less than one year, the investment earns simple, not compound interest. So, a certain investment gets me 8% per annum. If I calculate the annual effective rate for the same investment, it goes slightly higher than 8%. Why? Because there is a difference in an investment that gives you something per annum and it distributes that more frequently. So if you take a bank deposit and the bank says, I'm going to give you 8% per annum, but I'm going to pay it to you twice a year, 4%, 4%. So because you're going to pay it twice a year now, you're going to get higher than 8%. So if you want the formula, it's one point. 4% to the power 2 minus 1. So uh, this will give you something higher than 8%. So interest is payable at least twice a year. And that's why its annual equivalent rate or annual uh, effective rate 
is higher than 8%. A firm has decided to launch a type of product it has never sold before. Consequently, it should a reappraise the risk mitigation measures for all its other products, b conduct a risk assessment exercise immediately after the launch, c amend its corporate governance guidelines, d give particular attention to any regulatory issues. So why not D? Investment earns simple, not compound. So if you earn simple, not compound, then if you are 8% per year, your effective annual rate will be 8% per year because it is not compounded. But the question said, your annual equivalent rate is higher than 8%, so obviously it's being compounded. So... And going back to this question, a firm has decided to launch a type of product it has never sold before. Consequently, it should, since it has never sold this product before, then there is a chance that it might, it, it, it might be breaking some regulatory issues. So it has to give particular attention to regulatory issues. If it's launching a new product similar to something that it has done before, uh, then they already understand the regulation for that product they will concentrate on other areas. But if this is a new product, they will have to pay attention uh, because that product might be heavily regulated by the regulator. The industry best practice benchmarking is being carried out in order to assess the main internal drivers of a bank's business risk. What is the most likely to be carrying, who is most likely going to be carrying out this analysis? A the participants of a risk assessment workshop, B, members of the board, C, external consultants, D, a SWAT team from the bank's compliance department. So, so what we are doing here is we are benchmarking our business risk against industry best practice. So, um, are we following the standards? Are we following the recommendations that are usually taken that are usually followed in the market? Is there a gap? Are there some good practices in the market that we are not aware of that we should be following so that we can reduce our risk? So we are benchmarking ourselves against the industry best practice. So uh, who better knows the industry and the best practices than consultants? So this is most likely going to be carried out by external consultants. Not the board. Not the, not the risk assessment workshop, no. A SWAT, there is no SWAT team. SWAT is, uh, is a strategical tool. External consultants are more likely going to give you an idea because they are experts in the field and they know the latest industry best practices and they can benchmark you against these practices. Which of the following factors is most likely to cause a bank's liquidity limits to regularly change during the course of each day? The bank A. started operations nine months ago, B. operates on a global basis, C. has a relatively short maturity ladder, D. has, ent has identified significant market depth.
Okay. Which of the following factors is most likely to cause the bank's liquidity limits to regulatory change during the course of each day? Most likely going to be because they operate on a global basis. That's why their liquidity limits change many times a day. What is the fundamental principle behind hedging? An investor can offset the risks of a falling market by purchasing assets at a reduced price. An investor can buy products in one market at a better rate than the domestic market. The risk exposure of one instrument offsets the risk exposure of another instrument. The risk exposure of two instruments moves with the market. So hedging is risk exposure of one instrument offsets the risk exposure of another instrument, usually using derivatives. Which situation would be an operational risk as defined by the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision? A. Change in the market value of an asset. B. Sovereign debt reshuttling. C. Data center disruption. D. Failure of a counterparty. Okay. So which of the following is an operational risk? A, this is a market risk. B, this is a credit risk. C is the answer, this is an operational risk. D is a credit risk. Which of the following column headings should normally be included in a typical risk register? A, sources of assurance. B, method of assessment. C. List of affected stakeholders. D. Level of required approval. Remember, risk register is a sort of a ledger that records the risks that the company faces. You are more likely going to have a column that tells you about the sources of assurance or insurance, which is a way of reducing risks. An investment return has a relatively large standard deviation. This implies that the investment may be suitable for an investor with A, high risk strategy, low risk strategy, short term requirement, medium term requirement. This should be easy. So if you've got high standard deviation, that means it's high risk. Yeah, let's move on, it's easy. How does good succession planning help to maintain effective risk governance? It prevents a reward for failure. It encourages staff authority. It offsets the impact of change. It ensures the delegation of responsibility. Good succession planning. Succession planning is when somebody leaves, especially senior manager, like the CEO leaves. But before he does, 
uh, he already assigned who the next CEO will be. So why is that good? Because a big change like that, it's a big strategical change. And having a good succession plan reduces the impact of that change. The Basel Accords prescribed the minimum capital ratios for banks in relation to operational risk, credit risk, and which other specified risk? Market risk, interest rate risk, non-systematic risk, regulatory risk. I think this should also be easy for you. So you should have minimum capital for your operational risk, credit risk, and market risk. Which of the following underlying assets of a managed fund is most likely to cause the fund to be exposed to issuer risk? <coughs> Sorry. Futures, commercial property, corporate bonds, or treasury bills. So which of the following is most likely to be facing credit risk? So which of the following is most likely to be a credit instrument? Bonds. A chief executive personally oversees the writing of the company's operational risk policy, which is strongly supported by ex-colleagues in finance. However, the marketing department disagrees about the implementation as it had not been consulted during policy formation. This failure was due to a lack of each of the following, except sponsorship, cross-divisional involvement, consistency, roles and responsibilities. Remember, we're looking for which of the following is not a cause of that failure. And the answer is sponsorship. Because sponsorship means the backing and support of the board of directors uh, for a risk policy or for risk culture in general. So this doesn't have anything to do with the board. This tells you that the CEO uh, oversaw the writing of a risk policy uh, supported by ex-colleagues in finance. So a different department, the marketing department, disagrees with it. So this is a sign that there's a problem in these three points. But it's not a problem in sponsorship. This isn't about backing and supporting certain risk, uh, a certain risk uh, culture. 